In this roundup of a week, the surge in the South puts the coronavirus back on the US agenda. A backlash grows against Black Lives Matter, the organisation, and Facebook refuses to censor political speech whilst censoring political speech. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Welcome back to 2020, the year where, at the end, we all wake up and realise it was just a dream. A dream to some. A nightmare to others! I hope you're well and dodging the virus. And indeed, the virus has pushed its way back centre stage this week as the surge in the south of the United States has continued. Anthony Fauci said that it was a spike in cases that are well beyond the worst spikes that we have seen and suggested that it would all get a lot worse if the country proves unable to get a grip. He said he would not be surprised if the country began to see as many as 100,000 new coronavirus cases per day, which would be just under double what it has been in the last couple of days. But the question some people have raised is, how bad is this really? In spite of the fact that the surge in infections is now more than three weeks old, so far it's not clear that there's going to be a similar surge in fatalities. For the US overall, there's no sign of it whatsoever. If you look at some of the states that have seen the biggest surges, Texas, California, Florida, you're seeing maybe a small uptick in the most recent fatality figures. Maybe, although so far barely beyond the noise of variability. A big part of the reason for this seems to be that many of the people catching the virus in the recent surges are of the younger age group, the under 40s or so. And of course, the younger age groups are not the ones that are at most serious risk of developing fatal cases. Now, it could be that the younger age profile really does suggest that the waves were kick-started by the Black Lives Matter protests. These were, after all, gatherings of mostly younger people in closer proximity that started about four weeks ago and carried on. However, there are a lot of people who don't want to go there, and this week we saw just how far that determination could go. A study was published and made a few headlines to the effect that the Black Lives Matter protests didn't just not contribute to the recent surge in COVID-19 cases. Oh, no, 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 no. They actually slowed the spread of coronavirus down. Obviously, because anti-racism kills the virus. It's science. And as you might expect, that immediate snarky reaction was typical of about half of the population when they heard this story. The other half said, oh, thank goodness, see, we told you it wasn't a problem. As ever, let's step beyond the things that the partisans would like to believe and look in more detail at what the study actually said. So the researchers are not claiming that the actual people who go to the demonstrations are not putting themselves at a heightened risk. Andrew Friedson, one of the paper's co-authors, said, We think what's going on is that it's the people who are not going to protest are staying away. The overall effect for the entire city is more social distancing because people are avoiding the protests. They said that they didn't attempt to figure out whether the protests spread the virus, which would have been hard with a bunch of people like Andrew Cuomo specifically refusing to ask people with infections whether they'd been to a Black Lives Matter protest. But they looked at the bigger picture. They looked at 315 American cities with populations of more than 100,000 people, identified the 281 cities that had the protests and used the remainder as a control group. They said that they found the protest correlated with an increase in stay-at-home behaviour in the cities where they occurred. And the increase was larger in cities that saw more sustained protests or reports of violence. So the avoidance behaviour of the majority of the population outweighed the spreading behaviour of the protesters. That's for contention. Public speech and public health did not trade off against each other in this case. But he also added that this didn't hold true for other events, such as opening up outdoor venues, because it wouldn't create that avoidance behaviour. I have to say, reading the paper, it does read like some people who set out to support the Black Lives Matter protests. It goes into detail about the death of George Floyd that provoked them, and he says things like, 
At the same time, protests designed to galvanise public action for social justice are by definition large public gatherings in which it is difficult to avoid close contact with others. I would just assume a neutral science paper would talk about the large gatherings, which is the relevant factor, not the whole bit about galvanising public action for social justice. And you know, if you look at Friedson's Twitter account, it, He's not an extreme activist as far as the evidence consists, but he's certainly liking and retweeting standard Black Lives Matter protest tweets, which is what a number of people now expect. Since the letter signed by a thousand health professionals, none of whom, by the way, included any of the authors of this paper, saying that Black Lives Matter protests were justified because of the issue and in spite of the impact on COVID-19, People on the right have just lost a certain amount of faith that professionals in this field are able to put aside their own partisan leanings in their advice relating to the virus. Which is incredibly damaging, you might think. Because look at what this paper actually says. These demonstrations carried with them the threat of violence. People scared of being the targets of violence stayed away and that was a win on the pandemic. Public speech and public health did not trade off against each other. If you're prepared to overlook that you have a bunch of people scared of being the target of violence in their own community. I mean, that seems like quite an important factor for me. A negative factor, you might say. You could have taken this research and perfectly happily put it under the headline Black Lives Matter protests provoke fear of violence in a large percentage of the population. And you could also suggest that the data might support the contention that the events provided the seed corn for the upswing in the virus. Who was going to these protests? Predominantly young people. Who would be most afraid of violence? Predominantly older people. But it seems nobody wanted to run those sorts of headlines. The idea that you would celebrate the positive effects of provoking a fear of violence in the community that is something I find really quite remarkable. Now, this paper hasn't yet been peer reviewed, so maybe some of the commenters on it will highlight some of the issues underpinning its conclusions. Maybe. The mainstream media are mostly talking instead about Republican states that relaxed lockdown too soon and too far. It's all those people going out to bars that is feeding the problem. And it's perfectly possible that that is indeed a factor even if the problem was seeded by the protests, those young people then go to the bars and the younger they are, the more likely they're, you know, cavorting. I hear the young people do that sort of thing these days. Utterly disgraceful, rather than just sitting together and having a beer, which is all that the old duffers can manage. Of course, some people say, well, it must be down to the Republicans because you only have to look at where the surge is happening. Mostly Republican states. And that's because they're all stupid Trump-like people who prioritise the economy over human lives. And we saw yesterday the first named person who was at the Trump rally in Tulsa who had been confirmed with COVID-19, former presidential candidate Herman Cain, who has been hospitalised. At the age of 74, it's obviously not a trivial matter that he has the virus, which isn't stopping people making hay with the fact that he was at the Trump rally. But the virus doesn't care about your politics. So let's again step back for a moment, put this into context of what we've seen around the world, and not just in the US. Around the world, we've seen the places that were hit the hardest originally, by and large, not seeing a second wave as they relaxed lockdown. Italy, Spain, in the UK, London, in the US, New York, the places that were hit the hardest in the early stages tended to be the places of high population density, and particularly high population density where the local culture wasn't necessarily one that would naturally and quickly embrace high discipline. It's not the only causation factor, but there's a strong correlation. For all that people are saying that the numbers that caught the virus in those places weren't anywhere near a high enough percentage to create herd immunity from the virus, nevertheless, none of them are seeing a second wave. Different countries, different governments, different systems. A study this week by the Swedish Karolinska Institute suggests that immunity in former hotspots could be twice as high as previously thought, since up to a third of healthy people who never had symptoms may have developed immunity to it, something which wouldn't be picked up by the antibody tests, which have been less reliable anyway than previously hoped. 
And if that turns out to be true, it would certainly go some way to explaining why we have seen so few resurgencies. You can't, much though the politicians would love to, point at local leadership as being a huge factor in what happened in those places. Now, the Republican southern states that are being hit right now did not get hit much at all in the time when New York and some of the other Democratic states were under the most pressure. States with major urban areas of high density tend to be Democrat. More rural spread out states tend to be Republican. It's far more likely it's the nature of the territory than the policy of the state government that's the biggest factor. Which doesn't mean that governments can't do dumb stuff that makes things worse. By and large, that's kind of what governments do. But the propensity to do that doesn't seem to differ between the two parties. And of course, this is also why the study that said the protest didn't have an impact is again questionable. If you look at the areas where there were protests, many of those were in the big cities where we've not seen a growth in cases. Indeed, we've seen continued decline because the cities are where the most unrest happens, where the most protests happen. Those can average out the impact of a protest that took place in the major cities in the states that have seen the surge. But this really becomes one of those areas where people choose to believe what they want to believe. We don't have the evidence that the protests were a small or a large part of what seeded the wave of the cases that we're now seeing. What we do know is this. One, that perceived partisan influence on researchers in this area runs the risk of damaging the credibility of medical expert opinion if it hasn't already. Fairly or unfairly, just does. Second, that the United States is a big place. Just because it had an initial wave in one set of locations doesn't mean that the areas that largely didn't suffer first time round are somehow going to get off scot-free. The virus doesn't care about your politics. It also doesn't pay attention to national or state borders. Third, it might be worth experimenting with a more radical relaxation of lockdown in one of the places that was hit hard first time round. Because it seems possible that might be an okay thing to do and it'd be good to know. Now, I know that's asking a lot because the fear is it turns out to be wrong and suddenly does exactly what it did before, thousands more people die and so on. It would be a bad mistake to make, so I understand why people are not prepared to go there. And fourth, obviously we need to keep watching the death rates. It's possible that they will begin to go up as the initial group of infected young people gradually find their way to the next group of older people. In fact, it would be really surprising if that didn't happen. Indeed, if it didn't happen, that's really kind of important information. And if we could find some expert researchers who could investigate the phenomenon with a view to understanding what's going on, rather than just justifying breaches of lockdown in the name of anti-racism, well, that might be quite helpful. Speaking of anti-racism, it was only last week I was pointing out that Black Lives Matter, the organisation, is very much distinct and different to Black Lives Matter, the sentiment. I was wondering as I did so whether even saying it might get me some serious kickback from one direction or another. After all, various people have been fired for saying as much. But, you know, those of us with less to lose should at least make sure that we don't self-censor. Well, what a difference a week makes. Because suddenly, a lot of mainstream organisations that have been busily taking the knee, printing Black Lives Matter on football shirts and the like, have all started to notice that they may not entirely have understood the subtleties of what they were getting into including those who had no business not understanding those subtleties. The BBC, for instance, has instructed its staff not to wear Black Lives Matter badges on air because it said the campaign had hijacked the George Floyd's death for political reasons. The Premier League, which, as we discussed last week, had been splashing the phrase across stadiums, its football shirts and the social media accounts, has distanced itself similarly, saying that it was promoting the sentiment, not the organisation. And that isn't really what they were saying a week ago. And sport has had its own anti-racism campaigns for some time, so if it was just for sentiment, you think they'd use one of those existing slogans? Nevertheless, it's good that they have caught up. What made the difference? Predominantly because the campaign has been actively promoting the goal of defunding the police for anti-Zionism and for the overthrow of capitalism. And it's been tweeting accordingly, which eventually gets noticed. 
Black Lives Matter UK leader Joshua Virasamy particularly has been attacking Israel and the police in vigorous form, which has alarmed many previously naive supporters and led to what the Daily Telegraph suggested was a hemorrhaging of support. It's no surprise if you've actually followed the sorts of left-wing campaign groups that are the champions of the intersectional identity politics issues. But of course, for your standard sports athlete standing up to oppose racism and police brutality, which is about basic humanity, which is what nearly everybody feels in the face of those problems, they don't buy into the radical leftism. And in spite of the controversy, the slogan isn't going to disappear. England cricketers have announced that they'll be carrying it in the upcoming test series against the West Indies. They said in so doing, they were supporting the principle, not the political organisation. I'm not entirely convinced that's as easy as they think it's going to be. Sky Sports showed itself to be somewhat confused on the subject. It had all of its pundits wearing the logo and it had promoted the hashtag on its broadcast and social media feed. But then it seemed like that might stop when Matt Latissier slammed the group's left-wing ideology. Several other pundits also ditched for badges, but then others have continued to wear them, and Sky has said it's leaving the decision up to their presenters. Which is kind of interesting. Are there any other radical left or right-wing groups that Sky thinks could be promoted by its presenters on their discretion, you wonder? The opposition Labour Party leader Keir Starmer has similarly been drawing a line in the sand, much to the fury of the left. Not only has Starmer, since he arrived, been purging the party of what was described by many of rampant anti-Semitism that was allowed free reign under Jeremy Corbyn, so he wasn't going to be in tune with the anti-Zionism part, but he has also dismissed in no uncertain terms the idea of defunding the police. In return, Black Lives Matter UK responded with... Well, some vigour. They called him a cop in an expensive suit and said that he had no right to tell them what their demands should be. I'm not aware that he thought he was telling them what their demands should be. He was just pointing out that the idea of abolishing the police was nonsense, which seems fair comment. And I think it's still a mainstream view, at least for now. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem likely that the various institutions will take the next step and begin to properly question the whole intersectional culture wars that underpins the philosophy of a lot of these left groups. This was the week after all, when the comedy writer Graham Linehan, responsible for shows such as Father Ted and the IT crowd, was permanently banned from Twitter for saying that men aren't women. A shocking piece of overreach that's gotten some notice but really remarkably little. Now, what's getting all the real heat and noise is the refusal by Facebook to censor political speech, which is ironic because there seems to be a mini tsunami of censorship this week by the social media platforms, including apparently by Facebook, of political speech. It's not as though it's not been under pressure to do just that. Mark Zuckerberg's initial statement that, unlike Twitter, Facebook wouldn't censor political advertising during the election led to a storm of protest. This week, a number of corporate advertisers, including Unilever, Hershey and Honda, announced that they would not advertise with Facebook through July, which was connected to what campaigners in the mainstream media described as Facebook's inaction on hate speech. They made a lot of the fact that Facebook's stock fell by 8% last Friday when it was announced, which is always a thing people get excited about, but as almost always when such things happen, the losses were quickly clawed back the following few days. Several other companies, such as Starbucks and Coca-Cola, announced they'd be pausing advertising on all social media platforms, except YouTube, because presumably that's where they make real money, while they evaluated their position. This follows actions by the Stop Hate for Profit campaign, which is annoyed by the fact that, amongst other things, Facebook has named Breitbart News as a trusted news source and the Daily Caller as a fact checker, in spite, it says, of both publications having records of working with known white nationalists. Which is an impressive way of saying, if you've ever carried an article by someone we don't like, that's enough for us to declare you as beyond the pale. If you advertise with Facebook, the campaign declares your profits will be promoting hate, bigotry, racism, anti-Semitism and violence. 
But of course, it all really kicked off when Zuckerberg refused to follow Twitter in placing some kind of obstruction over messages by President Trump when he sent the message that he would mobilise the National Guard where sites were unable to contain the rioting. In particular, he used the phrase, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, which some argued was a direct threat or glorification of violence. Some of Zuckerberg's more activist employees rebelled against his decision not to take action, saying it was inconsistent with the company's standards. Indeed, it's now come out that Zuckerberg's team contacted the White House directly, trying to persuade the president's team to tone down the language or else pull it from Facebook themselves. And on May the 31st, Zuckerberg is thought to have called Trump directly, although we don't have any details of how that call went. In response to the accusation that it was being overly accommodating to Trump, Facebook made the following statement. While many Republicans think we should do one thing and many Democrats want us to do just the opposite, our job is to create one common set of rules that applies equally to everyone. We don't believe Twitter, YouTube, Facebook or any technology company should determine what words people should or shouldn't see from their elected leaders in a democracy. Now you'd think that would be a position that should be capable of getting respect from both sides, it probably satisfies neither, and certainly not the left campaign groups, whose view of what does or doesn't constitute hate speech probably encompasses everything the Trump campaign ever says. When a similar backlash took place against YouTube advertising, the company introduced new policies and enforcement, and the advertisers gradually drifted back, and maybe Facebook is already doing exactly the same thing. Today, the congressional candidate for Florida, Laura Loomer, who some have labelled as the Republican AOC, she announced that she'd been notified that Facebook has a new policy specifically ensuring that none of the ads for her congressional campaign can be shown on Facebook. And that's not an entirely out of the blue thing. Loomer is probably the most banned person in the country when it comes to social media. Just about every platform. And Facebook had already said that she personally wouldn't be allowed to return to Facebook just because she was running for Congress. Her strident anti-Islam position being the thing that's generally quoted as the reason why. But there's obviously a big difference between a personal account and the communication channel for a congressional candidate's campaign. Especially when Zuckerberg has probably correctly in my view, said that it shouldn't be down to a private company like Facebook to police political speech. That's assuming Luma is correct that no ads for her campaign are being allowed to run. It's not as though people are never jumping to conclusions on such things when it affects them. But this comes in a week when there's been some significant action across social media on removing controversial people. YouTube banned Stefan Molyneux, David Duke and Richard Spencer, amongst many others. The Verge website quoted a YouTube spokesperson saying this, We have strict policies prohibiting hate speech on YouTube and terminate any channel that repeatedly or egregiously violates those policies. After updating our guidelines to better address supremacist content, we saw a five times spike in video removals and have terminated over 25,000 channels for violating our hate speech policies. According to YouTube's policy, a channel only gets removed after it's received four warnings in total. All those channels, according to YouTube, were guilty of repeatedly violating its policies by claiming that members of protected groups were innately inferior to others as well as other violations. But the fact that it hits so many channels at once suggests something outside of a normal one warning plus three strikes and you're out process has been going on. Now, of course, YouTube is a private company. It can do what it likes. And if people have genuinely been promoting violence or something like that, then that shouldn't be tolerated. Stefan Molyneux has certainly responded, arguing that he has never promoted violence or encouraged hateful conduct. Elsewhere, Reddit announced a new content policy and banned around 2,000 subreddits, including popular ones devoted to President Trump. And of course, Twitter has recently banned figures such as Katie Hopkins, who promptly sprang back up on Parler. And Twitter continues a guerrilla war with Trump himself, most recently taking down the president's much reshared meme that carried the message, in reality, they're not after me, they're after you, I'm just in the way. This was taken down because of a copyright claim on the image used by the New York Times. And so it continues. Is it a big left-wing conspiracy? 
Conspiracy, no, but there's no doubt a lot of the employees of these companies are the recently graduated woke brigade, whose influence is also being felt in newsrooms and other workplaces. That becomes a pressure point for them. And with the election on the horizon, everyone watching and sharpening their knives, they're nervous. You know, the YouTube algorithm has been running on paranoia mode ever since the coronavirus sent their employees home, which is why every one of my own videos now gets demonetized on publication, only to be cleared two or three days later when a human being gets around to looking at it. The message from all that really stands as an answer to my earlier question in the light of the various organisations distancing themselves from Black Lives Matter, the organisation. No, the battle on free speech isn't over. With the election coming and with the various campaign groups on the march, it's really just beginning. And although everyone can end up heading off to the social media channel of their choice, whether it's Twitter or Parler, Ultimately, we need a mature understanding of the best enabling role of social media platforms with some agreement on where the line should be drawn. Needless to say, all this uncertainty makes me particularly grateful to the wonderful people that have signed up in the last couple of months to support this channel on Patreon. I never quite know whether I'm the middle of the road sober centrist that I thought I was or a dangerous radical as I felt in some of the recent episodes talking about the pandemic and Black Lives Matter. Either way, having supporters means I can focus on talking about the issues that matter regardless on whether they get demonetized by YouTube or not. So, as always, if you want to support the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content this channel aims to provide, please consider adding your support to that of the generous folks that have done so already. Either way, have a great week. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.